Major funding for these programs is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Greenberg Traurig, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Layumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Happ Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the CUNY TV Foundation, the Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. So everyone is so happy. The economy, the stock market is the highest level. The real estate is doing great. You know, the economy seems fine. Retail is doing well, hotels. But I don't know. I have this pessimistic feeling that it's really not that great, but it's good. So as opposed to having the pessimist provide his insight, I put together these individuals who will provide their outlook on where they see New York City today. My guests include Mike Slocum, who is the president of Capital One Commercial Bank, Dennis Russo, who is the chairman of the real estate practice for New York, Baker Hofstadter, Fred Burke, who is the co-chair of the real estate practice at Friedman LLP, and last but definitely not least, my friend Josh Muss, who is the chairman and CEO of Muss Development. So I have a banker, I have an attorney, I have an accountant, and I have a builder, owner, developer. I'm going to start with you because you deserve to be picked on, okay? <laughs> How do you look at it? I, I, you know, you and I have discussed this all the time, especially since we, we were also working together for this nonprofit to give some advice to them. We've seen ups and downs over the years. How do you see it? Are, are, we, you know, are we getting frothy? You know, how do you see that? I mean, the prices and everything. You've never seen rents like this in all the other situations. Um, I, I, I certainly think that it seems to be uh, in high speed. Uh, I don't think we've seen <coughs> real estate um, as frothy as you put it in many years. Uh, I'm also cognizant of the fact that uh, we have seven years of good, seven years of bad, seven years of good, seven years of bad. It's almost biblical in the way they do it. And uh, we're starting to get a little nervous. I mean, one doesn't want to admit it. One wants to think that it's going to keep on getting better. Um, I would prefer to be a seller today than a buyer. Uh, but it's, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. You know, it's very, very interesting. One of your clients uh, who just built a new building in Lincoln Center, uh, Gary Jacob and I were at breakfast about a week ago, um, and we're sitting there. And I said, "Okay, you you opened up the the rental office, and what are you getting? What are you getting for rents?" I said, "I'll, I'll bet you what you're getting." He said to me, "I'm getting ninety-five dollars a square foot in rent." I said, "It's ninety-five dollars. I mean, you're Amsterdam Avenue, okay? 
we're at the end of Lincoln Center. Nothing's wrong with Amsterdam Avenue. Ninety-five dollars a square foot is enormous. I mean, as a banker, how do you look at this? Because when we were talking prior to the show, with these high prices, banks have been reducing, not you, okay, other banks, okay, maybe the ones who have my, on the cups over here, but other, <laughs> uh, other banks have been, you know, uh, changing. What do you see, the, how do you look at the world today? You know, it's, uh, like you say, it's not great, but it's not bad. It's probably still pretty good, but we see a lot of uh, competition in the loan market for quality assets. And I think our concern is eventually interest rates are gonna go back up. So there's a lot of stuff getting financed today at really low interest rates and what happens so, five or so seven let, years from now. So let's look at that because, you know, Fred and Dennis representing companies in this way, you know, they're buying the property. They're saying, hey, I'm buying the property. I'm paying 3% on a loan, you know, uh, three and a quarter for this apartment. And, you know, they're, they're saying, I'll take a couple of years interest only, and then four to five years from now, you know, nobody has a crystal ball. No one knew that the Fed was going to maintain these rates for such a long time. You know, something, as Josh just brought out, seven good, seven bad, you know, over there, we don't know what the timing is. You know, and, you know, we, we have a, a crisis in Iran and Iraq. When you're underwriting, how, how do you look at deals today? I mean, I know that you guys look at its relationship, relationship, and established. But, you know, these other banks are coming out here, fifth and third, uh, came, and U.S. Bank and all these other places. How, how, this has an effect on everybody. It does. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I oversee our business across the country. And interestingly, New York still offers probably more attractive opportunities than markets that have less restrictions on what happens there. So there's still a constrained market here. There's still great demand. And for rental properties, I think the occupancy rate's around 99%. I'm, you know, I'm you can't quite. find that in Houston or Atlanta or Dallas. Because uh, everybody wants to live in New York. Right. Right. From wherever you're from, you find you know these people buying. There was a woman the other day that bought her two-year-old, like a $56 million so, or something. So wait a second. <laughs> you, you're the kid who grew up in the New York market. You're chairman of a New York real estate practice of a Cleveland, okay? And if I said anything about Cleveland, people, one, one comment is, nobody really wants to finance Cleveland. You know, uh, even Bank of, you know, uh, Ohio Savings Bank, which is a New York community bank subsidiary, they prefer not to finance Cleveland. So what do you see the market? You've been, you've been on the market, you do a lot of hospitality, you do a variety of things, you handle, represent banks. How do you see the world today? Well look, Mike is, Mike is and we represent a lot of lenders, we also represent a lot of developers. Um, Mike is right, interest rates, as everybody knows, uh, are keeping things down and cap rates the way they are. Uh, reality is that most, if you talk to most of your developer clients and the like, they still have a, a gung-ho attitude in respect of New York because it is still the best market. It is the most attractive hospitality market by far. We're still building hotels, not as fast as we were a few years ago, I can tell you that, but we're still building hotels. People look to put their money, here is the place. Foreigners, I have a Chinese client that just came in, a developer, they overpaid for a property, which I won't name, um, by probably 15 to 20 percent, and they knew it. And they're happy to put their money here. Com people, just to look have it at here. The, people look at the New bank. York as a safe haven. It's a safe deposit box. It's a safe box. deposit box. Yeah. You know, there's security, you know. But we have certain other things. We don't have the same mayors that we've had for the last 12 years. We have a different, we have a variety of situations. You represent a number of foreign investors. I know the firm does that. As long as interest rates stay low. And Manhattan, everybody loves Manhattan, especially the young kids and Brooklyn. I'm sorry, the tri-state area. I apologize. True, the, true. the man who <laughs> I, I do apologize. The, the Mecca of Brooklyn, the Mohammed. No, 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 no. He's right. No. And Brooklyn, uh, the right. kids love the tri-state area. This is where they want to be. Interest rates are low. Foreign money, as you mentioned, is unbelievable. We have we have money coming in from China, from India, from Russia, from Brazil, from Ireland. I just had a client who sold a 51% interest in a significant building at a 2% cap rate to a foreign investor. And when you have people like that coming in, the prices are going to just keep escalating. I agree with you. It is frothy. But with interest rates low and the desire to be in Manhattan, I personally don't see it ending in the near future. I think it's going to be stable for 
a little bit of a time, yeah. put it that way. I mean, you know, you're gonna see places like Bushwick and the like, which you know, was my father was a fireman, it was burning down during the time when I was a kid. Now people are saying, oh, we're doing a beautiful project in Bushwick. Since, the, since this stretch of time for our expansion has kept going a little bit more, I think, than before, now you start working your way out right to Bushwick and the like. I think that it's gonna stay relatively steady. It is frothy to a certain extent, but what you're talking about too, remember, are really core assets. So whenever you're dealing with a real core asset, the foreigner always comes in, uh, not always, but always comes but, in. But you know, and hospitality. And hospitality. Hospitality just, is just booking it. because of the foreigners. But I just did it. You know, right. Josh has the finest hotel in Brooklyn. He was the first one, he was a visionary over there. He has the Marriott at the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, which in addition to having the space and everything else, it has the largest catering facility and it's a meeting place and everything over there. I, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, took a walk over the 59th Street Bridge and went to Long Island City specifically to look around what was happening. It was a Sunday. And I went to the left section, which was really no, more closer to Astoria, and I saw approximately 25 hotels. I didn't hear one uh, U.S. citizens speak. Everything was a foreign language. But all of these hotels are being built there. Brooklyn, who has, you know, as we were saying, the buzz that people want to be there, you know, they don't have 27 hotels in Long Island City. You know, there's a question of saturation and the point. You know, when people, you grew up in Bushwick, you knew it. Is, is Bushwick the next place for the new Wythe Hotel? I mean, you know, I... You know, My father I, grew up in Bushwick, but anyway, go No, ahead. no, but <laughs> what, what I'm saying to you is that there are neighborhoods, okay? You know, whenever I discuss Brooklyn and we get to... Josh has... Josh was the creator of Oceana, uh, which is this luxury condominium. You still have one tower being built there? Yeah, we're finishing up the last one. Now, when I talk about Brighton Beach or Coney Island, I always have this, the same comment from all the people here. It's too far. It takes too long to get into the city. It takes no, no problem because everybody wants to be. It's a 45-minute ride to, to, to Brighton Beach. Brighton Beach, at least you can get off the train and walk to, to housing. Coney Island is a difference. You get off the train and then you have a distance. So is every section, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking that everything is good, but, you know, does this pass on? I mean, you operate, in, as we said, in many states. But you also operate in New Jersey and Long Island. How do you look at the world in those markets today? New Jersey, I think, is spotty. I think there are areas that are okay. We do a lot of stuff on the Hudson, Hoboken, Jersey City. And when you get more into the state, uh, we've done some office that has been a little challenged. It's kind of spotty. And Long Island, um, you know, spotty. is still sort of a self-contained area, too. And well, so uh, we don't do as as much out there. Everybody wants to kind of be, you know, if they're not in Manhattan or Brooklyn, they want to be pretty close yeah. just See, that's, because of all the commute. That's the difference. I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. But that's the difference because when you look at the things out in uh, Long Island or in New Jersey and you look at the effective rents, and you always look at the effective rents, the effective rents, they haven't moved in years. I mean, you're talking 27 <coughs> to $32 a square foot. I mean, I do the, tons the, of leases. The, the in office, New York, the you office, move from 50 you, you know, to 70. But isn't well, what we, happening, I'm sorry, New York City companies like ours are taking office space in the suburbs because you don't want to pay 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars a foot. Therefore, you're opening locations and people are moving there because they want to work near their office. Sure. Yeah. We're, we're seeing a real ripple effect. I mean, let's face it, New York City is going to be relatively recession proof because when times get bad, people want to be in New York City. When times get good, they want to be in New York City. So we're seeing that in the, in the boroughs, and we're, and we're doing, thank God, work in Manhattan too, but we're seeing in the boroughs, there's a, all of a sudden, we're getting better rents, and we're getting better occupancy, and, and in the better retail areas, we're getting filled up. Uh, in fact, vacancies in the, in the last few years have been almost a thing of the past. It's just a matter of price, and if you price it right, you're going to rent it out. So I, I think New York City is doing very well, is doing probably better than anywhere else, and I think it will continue that way. It's just a matter of how high one expects it to go. But, you know, as Mike was saying, you know, and, and Dennis was also alluding, you know, the office market in New Jersey, the office market in Long Island and Westchester really hasn't gone up in years. It's the same rent, and the, the expenses are <coughs> higher. 
And that's why the, white, the Westchester market, the real estate taxes kill you, and so did Nassau County over there. Those are the, the different situations. You know, uh, you have an office in Long Island. It's a different business. Your client business that you deal with. Different it's, business. But with today's technology, we're doing work out of Manhattan, use, utilizing people on Long Island. But he's right. doing we, that, ha we have an but office. He's, but he's doing that in the law profession yeah. Yeah. with Manhattan doing work out of Cleveland. Cleveland, Florida, 14 offices. I use That's associates great. at half the number. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to use our people, too, by the way. Yeah, no, we're utilizing, it, it, let's face it, it's cheaper space. You pay right. people less. They're just as effective at certain, at certain things. And Absolutely. So you utilize them. And so it's going to work. As long work. as you can manage them properly, it's a fantastic thing. It's a great thing. Absolutely. It keeps everybody happy. Fantastic thing. So, we, we, we have a big presence in Melville. We had 700 associates in a, in a building there and we plan to stay there for the very reason most of them live out there they like right. being there it's not that bad a commute if you need to come in to our office right. in the city but you know you don't want to have your primary office in Melville and try to attract people from New Jersey or Westchester County so that's why you we, end we, up we, we, in Manhattan because then you can draw from you know Manhattan's Jersey, mother's. Westchester and Long Island well you need to be here you need to have yeah. just like just like retail I'm not going to shift the conversation but retail we've been buying retail now Oh my lord! In New York City, it's. But let's talk insane. about retail. Let's talk about retail. Let's talk about hospitality. You know, there was an article, and I, I think Steve Quozo brought it up very well. The article say, "Poor Danny Meyer, thirty years he can't afford the, the, the rent at Union Square Cafe." And Steve Quozo said, "You know what? Look at his revenue thirty years ago, and look at his revenue today. What's the rent? Okay." Bobby Flay is complaining that you can't afford to open up a restaurant, and he just opened up a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, you know, so the, the story of, you know, that, that the, the landlords are gouging, okay, maybe in certain markets in the meatpacking district and other areas, uh, you know, in um, Chelsea, you know, or Midtown South, it's over there. But there is a lot of vacant space. You know, time time is leaving. Mid Sixth Avenue is a very I, reasonable I, neighborhood. Ca gouging is a pejorative word. <laughs> I was getting, what they're doing is the landlords. That's what are, happens if when you, you recall? Went, if if, if you recall, Harvard, you know, if you, I forgot about I'm with Josh. If you, re <laughs> if you recall what I said before, we're able to get everything filled up as long as we ask for the right rents. So. If, the, if you're asking for the right rents, you'll lease it up. If you're asking for the wrong rents, you don't lease it up. And if you're getting $500 a square foot in some side street, then you're getting the right rent. It's a matter of everything floating to the top. Look, uh, Uniqlo is planning to open up more stores. Everyone's coming to this market over here. Retail is very strong over here. Trader Joe's would love to have more stores. Aldi, you know, you know it's, this is the market. You know, this, this is where we're looking at it. Are there any areas, you know, when, when you go down to headquarters and they ask you where, is, where are the best opportunities, where do you look besides Manhattan? I mean, what areas are you positive on retail? Are you, what's your feelings of the hospitality market? In, in the you know, we don't do much hotel because it is a more volatile asset class. Sure. And we like to do not only sort of the interim loan, but we like to do permanent loans. And permanent loans on hotels is a little dicey. So we don't do too much of that. But we look at uh, some retail around the city, and, and we see good opportunities there with a lot of very quality uh, developers. And, uh, and we do a lot of office in Manhattan, and what, but what's not the, a lot of office. You, you know, he, here's something. You know, <clears throat> the Trade Center is coming on board. They just approved Larry's. He's getting the Liberty Bonds to build the, the addition over there. Uh, fortunately, Brookfield has done exceptionally well. They, they're nearly fully leased, even with the loss of Lehman and everyone else downtown. But do you, are we worried about some of the office space in Midtown? Or as I said recently on the show, where can that, not the Freedmans, where can that smaller nonprofit or that smaller law firm or the smaller accounting firm, they're getting priced out. Nonprofits don't belong in Midtown. They belong where the office rent is cheap. Correct. Wherever correct. that might be. That's correct. And uh, actually, there's a lot of uh, self-help going on. A lot of the vacant office space has been converted to apartments. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm concerned that you convert too many to apartments and you lose the central office district. And that that's could be a problem because the greatest of New York is <coughs> that you have a transportation that comes into the heart of New York City.
And any thoughts about this <coughs> potential uh, midtown uh, zoning? <laughs> Won't be built when I'm alive. <laughs> you don't think it's going to? Uh, it may happen. It may happen. The question is, will it happen under de Blasio? I, I tend to doubt it. Um, it may happen. That'll add space. Fine, but it'll only add enough, enough, as much space as we can take. I mean, we do overbuild every once in a while. But to answer your question, where is the spot for, um, you know, the, the tenant that needs forty dollars a square foot, or forty-five, or even fifty, as I may go? The answer to that is, and the crowd will listen to me and buy there, is uh, in Lower Manhattan, Class B space. Yeah. If you're smart, you're buying Class B space there because what you're talking about, Michael, is the top. You're talking about ninety-five dollars a square foot, ninety dollars a square foot. You know, there's been a lot of tenants looking to be in Manhattan and they can't afford it. That Class B space, just like Park Avenue South did, that will fill up. What about, where, where do you see this? Where, you know, when people come to you, you know, uh, the funds and other people asking for your advice in looking at a market, how do you look at, how do you, th um, you know, and they ask you about Lower Manhattan and people are now looking at the Hudson Yards. I mean, this is, you know, you have a lot of property that recently has traded at very high prices in the Hudson Yards, one of your clients. So we just did the biggest deal on 34th Street. Right. That was a second sale for them too. Right. Yeah. So what, what's happened is, you know, the Hudson Yards are very nice, but you know, at least Related is doing it with Oxford in a very systematic approach. They're, they're you know, they're not building any spec office building over there. But there's a spec office building on 40th Street uh, I was walking today, Gary Barnett's uh, gem tower, the other side of the building, is, it was spec and it's empty today, okay? Uh, there are a couple of buildings, you know, that are, and Third Avenue, you can still probably get rent at 40 bucks a foot, $45 I a foot. I think you can. But back to what Josh said, if these folks would price this at a, at a little lower yeah. level, I think it would lease I think pretty so. easily. People are always looking, hold for, out for the, for the people always looking for new Class A space. So it'll shift over and then but you, you get conversion but you, The trouble properties. is with the internet. Every day you're reading, this guy's renting out for $50. This guy's renting out for 90 This guy's selling for $3,000 a square foot. And everybody thinks they can do the same thing. The information is too free-flowing, too exaggerated. The brokers are exaggerating what they're able to get. And before you know, people are overpricing. And, and, and there, are, there is space I'll, going I'll, for I'll give I'll give you a great example. Uh, when Capital One was looking for space and Mike and I were talking, 280 Park Avenue, which is owned by two REITs, Vornado and S.O. Green. They've spent millions of dollars renovating the property, and they have not signed one tenant to that property. You don't and read about those. Okay. <laughs> you, you know, we're talking about close to 1.1 million, 1.2, 3 million square feet of space. And nobody's biting right now for that. And Park Avenue is, a, is still a prime I, th location. I think they're not biting at what they're asking. Which I is, think there's plenty, which is what Josh, plenty of interest. Right. It's a yeah. nice building. I think they've done a great job. I, I per, we were very close. But I we, personally don't see how convenient the West Side is for access. I mean, you're trying to interact with the lawyers, with the, with the accountants, with the customers. You can't get to the West Side. And even when they get that one subway stop in, it's going to be very difficult you know, to access. It's, it's one subway stop. Yeah. It, it's like I went to Williamsburg a couple months ago with my wife. We took the, the L train. It was a Saturday. It was packed. You know, we took the first stop. You can't get off. So what we're going to have the one st subway stop at 34th Street and 11th Avenue, 10th Avenue. And, you know, that's supposed to take care of everything, including all the apartments and everything else. I think it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. That's impossible. Yeah. That's impossible. What I about mean, traffic has just gotten worse. Oh, it's terrible. In just the last... Ten years I've been here, seems like there's construction on every cross street. Yeah. Trying to get cross town is, is a nightmare these days. Yeah. I thought it might be a little better this summer. You know, I spent some time yesterday and today trying to get cross town, and they keep closing lanes on the avenues uh, to create bicycle lanes and parking. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> so I, I think one thing they've got to do is try to work a little bit on the traffic or because you know, you're not gonna, can't create subway stops overnight. But part of the, the traffic difficulties, besides the new construction and everything else, was uh, par partially created by Bloomberg in certain markets with the, the areas stopping, you know, like in Times Square, you, you have streets. 
the pedestrian, pedestrian markets over there. They've they've cut that down, and that's had a, a major effect. I mean, has the pedestrian markets been in effect in downtown Brooklyn also? No, it hasn't really impacted yet. I mean, there's still plenty of pedestrian traffic. I I actually just walked in from the other side of the street to come here, and near the Empire State Building. You can't pass. I mean, you just can't walk. <laughs> well, that's uh, tourists. And, that's... Uh, yeah, well, tourists have taken over a great deal of the sidewalk space, a great deal of the traffic space. You have the buses going along. They're good for us. They're bad for us. And if they stop traffic, it's not good for us, but maybe good for the hotels. Well, 54 million people or so, I think the number okay. is. God bless them. At Rock Center up by me, yeah. it's packed. 42nd Street, it's yeah. packed. Yeah. packed. Yeah. 34th Street by the Empire State Building, it's packed. You know, I look at it and I complain, then I say, God bless yeah. right. that they're <laughs> yes. here. I hate work. Because they keep, they keep putting people, 35 million room nights. You know, you can't. I mean, New York City has reinvented itself. They have, they have the hospitality like never happened before. The tech seems to be catching on. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why New York City is so popular, because you don't have, you have a, a different type of people coming in here that don't want to commute. That's why there's so many people looking for housing. You have people coming in from all over the country. The smarter people, the tech people, the creative people, the people who want to get married, all the people that come here. Kids love it and they do not want to commute. That's right. They will pay whatever it takes to be here. I got, I got an email from my cousin whose kid is in uh, New Jersey looking for an apartment. He says, do you have an apartment? He wants a $1,500 square a month. I said, no. <laughs> well, three roommates. It doesn't <laughs> exist. Right, with three roommates. But you know what? But, but you bring up th something which Mike was saying before on what they do in some financing on the, on the Jersey side over there. You can go to Jersey City in a brand new building with all these amenities right on Journal Square, and you pay... As I was saying, Gary uh, Jacobs at 92 at Lincoln Center, we're talking 42. Or, okay, and in a couple of months, uh, my friend Alan Goldman at SJP uh, is opening up in Fort Lee, which is going to be a test uh, of what's going on. And they're planning to, to get about 38 to $40 a foot right at the, at the uh, George Washington Bridge. So these are convenient situations, and I think part of that, you know, even though as somebody said, they want to be in Manhattan, but they also have to be realistic that you don't have that much availability of space and everything else. Uh, young people aren't realistic. Right. right. Young people want to be, they want to walk out That's their door. Right. You say, what's the difference? It's a huge difference. It's a, it's a commute, even if it's 20 minutes. There's a difference between walking out your door and living in Union Square and being in Union Square Park and seeing the... It's Vitality. so vibrant. And when you so leave vibrant. work, you want to walk to happy hour yeah. as a kid. Well, that's what you and, want. And you don't want to try to figure out how to get back to Jersey. At exactly. <laughs> that's true, too. Right. Yeah. So, that's therefore, right. they'll, live, they, they'll well, live four in a room if they have to and spend, you know, do so, that. So, in summation, how do you see the next year, year and a half? The next year, year and a half, New York City. I think that the de Blasio administration um, won't have, in that period of time, a tremendous impact, you know, with the affordable housing. It will hurt us a bit. But the reality is I think things are going to stay kind of the same. I don't think things are going to, I don't think things are going to blow out of the water and get even tremendously more expensive. Um, but you look, at, uh, you look at Hong Kong, you look at London, you say it can't get more expensive. Yes, it can. Okay. But I don't think it's going to get more expensive. I think we're going to be stable. So in a couple of months, we'll come back and we'll see if our uh, ideas and predictions come through. I'd like to thank Sounds Mike, good. Dennis. Uh, Fred and Josh, and I'll see you next week.